Hello, hello, everyone. I am Ben Pick with the OWASP Nova chapter, and we have a very, very special guest with me. I'm joined by Bjorn Kaminic. Sorry, Bjorn Kaminic, and um, he is with the OWASP Juice Shop. And before I hand everything off to him and let him explain about his wonderful tool, a teaching vulnerable application, I wanted to just go a little housekeeping and say that we have an upcoming meeting next month, so be sure to follow us and be aware of, of um, the messages that we send out because it's going to be a capture the flag event. So it'll be something that's very more, uh, a lot more interactive than these back and forth um, uh, than, than, our, than our usual YouTube meetings. And the, uh, the OWASP 20th anniversary conference is coming up in September. So be sure to sign up and register. It's going to be a very, very large all virtual meetup so there's going to be wonderful people speaking, such as Bjorn. So be sure to register and attend. And without any further ado, um, can you please take away Bjorn? Thank you, Ben. Hi, everyone. My name is Bjorn Kimmenich. I'm uh, from Hamburg in Germany. Uh, in my local time zone, it's uh, 6 o'clock in the evening right now. And I learned that for you, it's basically a lunch break session this time. So thanks for scheduling it in an in a EU-friendly friendly way. So I would actually like to talk and show you, uh, talk to you and show you a little bit of the uh, OWASP Juice Shop project. So basically, we will do a quick uh, run through the entire entire project's capabilities and dive into a few, into a few sp uh, specific topics, probably a little bit more into the newer ones. So maybe if you already heard about the juice shop in general, I hope there's still enough new stuff in, uh, available here for you in the, in the session. Yeah, so as I said, my name is Bjorn. Um, I'm uh, the project lead of the, of the OWASP juice shop project. I'm also one of the chapter leads of the German chapter. And I'm currently also the chair of the uh, OWASP project committee, which uh, this, that position I actually received via, uh, via dice roll on random.org, all the other positions I basically got uh, actually voluntarily. So, but uh, yeah, today it's it's all about it's all about the OWASP juice shop. So let me go into full screen and let's let's start. So I guess we can basically skip the what is OWASP part because we are in an OWASP meetup and. Uh, probably everybody knows about about that so we already saved like half a minute what we shouldn't skip is why is this project actually called juice shop right so that came from an or comes from an actual german word which is uh, saftladen and saftladen is uh, is a really really terrible terrible store it can also be a terrible bar or restaurant so it's really a some place where you get a really really bad shopping or service experience and uh, that is in German composed from Saft and Laden, which is juice and shop in English. So that's how the project name came to be. Actually, um, the, 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 the initials that, that you get with this, JS, that this matches also JavaScript. That was really just a pure coincidence. Um, and that coincidence then later also led to the creation of the nice logo, which is uh, this leaking juice box. Uh, that looks like the JavaScript logo. So here are a few customer testimonials about the juice shop. So someone actually wrote on Twitter, and I have the links to the original tweets here. So it's not made up or anything like other customer testimonials might be. Um, so it's the most trustworthy online shop out, out there. It's the best juice shop on the whole internet, which is really nice statement. And uh, one statement actually from uh, from Andrew, the uh, our our current uh, uh, OWASP, uh, what's the, the leadership position name? I forgot. But he's actually our, our staff lead in, in OWASP at the moment. And he said that this is actually the most bug-free vulnerable application in existence. And we will get a little bit into that uh, later because we actually take care a lot about code quality, test coverage, and making the juice shop as actually usable and uh, really bug free as possible while still being a nice vulnerable application to play with. 
someone also said that this first makes you laugh and then actually cry. And the best quote actually from my point of view is that the wife of uh, some of our colleague actually said, this has, doesn't have anything to do with juice. So she was uh, not really convinced by the, by the shop. So before we dive into any uh, specific things, a short happy path shopping tour for those who never, who've never seen the juice shop before. So when you start the juice shop, this is typically typically what you get. This is the the latest released, the latest version plus a few uh, upcoming uh, changes. So you get a nice welcome banner that we can immediately dismiss. You get the unavoidable tracking um, uh, cookie warning thanks to the EU and you get a nice list of uh, of products right so if you have not if you have used the juice shop recently but not the very latest version you might not have this fancy product here yet so we actually sell now 20th anniversary tickets for the OWASP uh, anniversary in September but this is of course just a link to the to the actual conference page so if you have not registered yet like Ben said you sh really should because it's free and it will be great so you can see there's lots of different different products here in store, like all juice kinds of juicy things, even a fruit press, which is quite impressive, I think. But also lots of juice shop merchandise, right? From coasters over holographic stickers, mugs, and even my personal favorite, there's uh, temporary tattoos, right? And this is not this is not fake. You can actually buy those tattoos and some other nice things for example also very tasty raspberry juice so the shop is full of full of nice stuff now how, how do i buy things i mean i can click at different items and they pop up and i can even see that some actually got some reviews from customers and seems there are some bonus points that i can get but how can i actually do shopping well maybe i need to log in with a user account right that would make sense so i will actually not go through the registration because it takes a while but i will use a demo user with a, an awesome password that is set up and ready to go for shopping even has some money in their uh, in their in-store in wallet so let's see what do we what do we actually want um I totally want hol uh, one holographic sticker. That would be nice. Also, this nice trading card here. That looks also sweet. And definitely a set of tattoos, right? So, and maybe maybe also some some raspberry juice. So let's see. Let's go into the shopping basket. Uh, it seems I didn't click properly on the holographic stickers, but I will just take some more tattoos instead, right? That's totally fine. I can also try to get a few more juice shop trading cards, but it's telling me that I can only order one. Okay, good. Never mind. So I will have to pay 1064 of whatever currency that means. Um, and let's check out. And I will get some bonus points. I can select my shipping address as you would expect. I can, oh, I can even pick my delivery speed. So let's see. Well, I'm, I want fast delivery. Three days is fine. And how do I want to pay? I have my credit card registered here, but I also have some, some budget on my, uh, on my, on my wallet, um, but it's not sufficient. So I probably have to pay with my credit card now. Let's see what other options do we have here. Oh, here's some donation link because after all, this is an open source project. So we can of course always use some uh, donations to make us, uh, to, to help us build new and cool things. And there's also links to some actual merchandise. Very nice. Let's continue. Review our order. Okay, makes total sense. And let's place it. Thank you for your purchase. Order will be delivered in three days. Perfectly fine. I can now tweet about my order as you probably always want to, 
right? Because every shop of offers, offers something like that for, for some reason. I can view my order confirmation over here. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Seems consistent with what I saw on screen. Very nice. And I can also directly go into the tracking page and see that it's currently in the warehouse status, so to say, and it will be delivered in three days. Awesome. All right, so that was basically the the happy happy path path shopping tool. I could now also click around a little bit more and see that there's lots of functionality available now that, uh, now that I'm, I'm logged in actually. So I can actually edit all my uh, financial address information. I can even, oh my goodness, I can even set up two-factor authentication. Isn't that amazing? And maybe I shouldn't have shown this QR code live on screen, but well, never mind. It's just a zoo shop, so nothing, nothing bad will happen now. Um, I could also request my uh, to to erase my data to comply with uh, with GDPR laws and all kinds of things. And over here, there's also some other interesting functionality, right? From being able to leave feedback and complain if an order wasn't wasn't properly processed. I can then upload my invoice here, and I can even use the support chat chatbot to to talk a little bit. If I'm if I'm uh, if I feel lonely, then I have someone who answers me actually. So, and maybe I can even ask some questions. Can I get a coupon, please? Not possible. Sorry, we're off coupons. Okay, too bad. So this this gives you a, a rough idea of what the juice shop, uh, what what things the juice shop can do, right? So it it's supposed to actually feel like a real shop e-commerce system, and to a certain extent, it actually emulates it quite well, I think, right? So it looks kind of realistic, not perfectly, but uh, it, it works as a, as a small e-commerce uh, system, actually. So of course, that is not the main purpose of the juice shop, right? Because it's an OWASP project and I'm not really in the juice business. So what we're actually offering is hacking challenges. The juice shop contains 100 challenges that uh, where you have to exploit uh, one or sometimes more um, different types of vulnerabilities to actually get some some uh, some things to happen, right? So like logging in with someone's account or creating a specific cross-site scripting, stuff like that. And as you can see here, there's lots of different categories, basically everything that you find on the current and also I think last two editions of the OWASP top 10 is here and available. I hope with the new uh, upcoming OWAS top 10 release, we will still cover everything. If not, we have to probably add another challenge for whatever new uh, risk is being put on the on the new top 10 list. But that's basically one thing that the Juice Shop is very proud of, that we cover everything in the top 10 and also have lots of additional vulnerabilities which are, which are not OWAS top 10 related. Our challenges range from in difficulty from uh, one to six stars. So starting very easy and going down to very, very hard, right? So the one star challenges are very beginner friendly and the six stars are sometimes next to impossible. Um, so there, there you also there you actually have to sometimes follow a lot of different breadcrumbs to actually come to the right. Uh, or find the right attack vector and actually uh, do the right exploit. And sometimes you have to do different attacks in a row to actually make make these challenges work. And some are just a bit wacky as well, right? So we, we also have some fun challenges which are not that serious. The progress that we make when we hack the juice shop is uh, tracked on the juice shop scoreboard where you can basically see all the challenges that you already already solved um, and also a lot of additional information. I, I will show a little bit of that uh, uh, a little bit later. So when you solve a hacking challenge, you also get some immediate feedback with this kind of green push notification telling you that you successfully exploited one of the one of the vulnerabilities. So it's 
not only keeping track, but it's also actively informing you about your, your success, which is quite nice. If you, for some reason, um, crash your server or you just want to stop for the day and pick it up again tomorrow, as long as you have your cookies enabled in your browser, then um, basically your entire hacking progress will be restored next day when you start your server again. And this is basically triggered by, by, the, by the cookies that you have in your browser. You can, of course, delete them to start from scratch, but this way we make sure that you don't lose your entire progress. The Juice Shop has a very nice beginner-friendly feature as well, which is the, the so-called uh, hacking instructor, which helps you to to find uh, to to solve some of the easier challenges, right? So we have at the moment a total of ten tutorials. So for ten different uh, vulnerabilities or uh, challenges, there's uh, tutorials available, and they will basically guide you through um, what you need to do step by step, which is quite nice. And we added a little while after that um, a, an enhanced version of this of these uh, hacking instructor scripts, which we call tutorial mode. Here, the basically the the scoreboard is reduced to only those challenges where tutorials are are available. So basically, the first ten, and it basically forces you to first solve the I think it's three tutorials with one star difficulty. So you first have to solve those. And when you solve those three, then the, I think, three or four two star challenges with tutorials are unlocked, so to say, right? And then you continue with those. And then the last three star challenges. And when you solved all the 10 that come with a tutorial, then you basically get the, um, the full scoreboard unlocked and can basically pick whatever challenge you, you like. This is totally optional. So by default, tutorial mode is not turned on, but you can configure the Juice Shop to actually run it like this, which can be a very interesting setup, especially when you when you know that you want to train a, a, a group where most of mostly beginners, right? And you don't want to overwhelm them with, uh, with a scoreboard that shows 100 different things. And they might not actually know what, what they should do with that. Here's one thing that is brand new. That's why it's uh, appropriately highlighted here in the in the slides. The Juice Shop now has a vulnerable code snippet feature. So for some of the challenges, we actually um, show an additional button where you can see um, the un the actual underlying code, and it's your task to actually find the vulnerable line. What you see here in the screenshot is basically the current uh, version that is released. Um, that is basically what I what I uh, created, where it was just a code snippet, right? And then you could look through it and see, okay, what what line might be the responsible one for the problem? And then if you thought you found it, then you could hover over this little um, this little button down here, and it would reveal with CSS magic what lines are the actual vulnerable ones, right? So that was basically my, let's say, minimum viable implementation for this kind of thing. But we actually had something different in mind with this. And this is where I will switch over to the juice shop now and show you, first of all, the scoreboard itself. And how you can actually make those code snippets visible. So it takes a while to load because it, there's a lot of challenges that have to be rendered here. And you can also see, this, see the notification here at the top. And you can do all kinds of filtering and stuff if you like, that's, that's totally fine. And you can see here that some of the the challenges have this red little button that is for the tutorials, right? But a lot of them also have this uh, these, these angular bracket button. That is basically for showing this code snippet. So let's pick one that is not too hard. Like for example, we have a DOM XSS challenge, right? So where you are supposed to, to actually perform a DOM XSS which is not that hard to actually do. There's also a tutorial for that, but let's pretend we already 
uh, solve that. And now we actually take a look at the underlying code, right? And this is not some fake code snippet that we hard coded somewhere. This is the actual code in the um, source in the in the code base of the juice shop. So now the question is, where is the vulnerable line? And as you if you compare this with the with the screenshot that I showed, this little spoiler area is gone, right? And instead, you can now submit the line that you think or lines, multiple ones that you think are, uh, are responsible for the problem, right? So maybe I'm thinking, okay, line seven, that is definitely cross-site scripting. And then I submit it and it tells me, okay, that's that's not that's not right. But then I rethink it maybe and see this lovely line here with bypass security trust HTML, that sounds really brilliant. So maybe that is the actual reason for the cross-site scripting. So and if I submit this, hello. So I not only get this, this uh, success uh, icon here, but also I click and click again, I also get some confetti, right? So this was actually the right, the right solution. This is basically the first step of making something really fancy and cool out of these uh, vulnerable code snippets. Because that is that is not where we actually plan to stop. Um, we actually want, after you've selected the right vulnerable line, we would sh offer you three or four different possible code fixes, and you have to select the right one which you where you think that is it's the best fix for the problem. And then you get, if you if you pick the right one, then you get confetti again. And also you get um, additional um, points or completion percentage for, for the coding challenges um, in parallel to the to the um, to the hacking challenges, right? So basically the scoreboard will not will, will basically have two progress bars probably at some point, one for hacking and one for finding uh, vulnerable code locations and uh, selecting the right fix. So it's basically becoming even even more uh, useful to developers to actually learn how to avoid security issues in their code. That's that's the whole point. And this thing is basically one of um, one of our Google Summer of Code projects of this year, right? Um, basically making this first attempt into something completely new and uh, add a completely uh, completely different angle on on uh, on learning and uh, teaching into the juice shop something that is not as brand new but also still quite new so it's still worth the neon css um, the juice shop has a cheat detection built in now so when you and that is that is, I don't want to oversell this, but it's it's kind of nice because um, the juice shop will remember when you solved the last hacking challenge, and it will then measure the time between when that happened and when you solve the next hacking challenge, and then it will calculate okay how long should it take a regular user um, to actually solve one of the next challenges, right? So if you, for example, you can see this here in the in the in the sample log. And the first challenge that you solved, right, was a two-star challenge, and uh, it was basically solved in in one minute. So the assumed time it would actually take you, or should probably take most people to actually solve this, is two minutes. So this is getting a roughly forty percent cheat rating, right? So, and this is basically done for all the challenges, and. Uh, Basically, it just means the faster you are, the more cheat points you basically assemble. And uh, um, there are some some special conditions. For example, some challenges are coupled, so you might actually solve them in one step. And there, we actually, of course, don't don't count 100% cheat chance, right? So if you solve a couple challenge, it basically is assumed that this can be solved in zero minutes. So you don't get any any evil cheat points, right? 
Um, the same for the tutorial challenges, for example, there we, um, for example, assume um, that you have, that you use a little bit more time because it's the, it's the beginner challenges, for example. So it's not, I mean, it's not perfect. Um, and we don't actually publish this to the to the user of the juice shop. So it's not, you don't, do not see this in the client anywhere. It's only logged on the server side. And if you're just hosting the juice shop for yourself, then I mean, really no, nobody really cares, right? So you can basically do what you want. But if you consider a situation like a training uh, or a university lecture where maybe you have some centrally hosted instances of the juice shop, maybe the teacher actually would like to see if the students are trying to do some hacking exercises themselves, or if they just downloaded some script from the internet uh, that just runs over the entire juice shop and solves everything, right? More or less automatically. Then they will get a very high uh, rating in, in uh, uh, cheat probability. Good. So another feature that is pretty popular in the juice shop, I think, is that it's uh, you can easily use it in uh, capture the flag events. So you can, uh, with configuration, some very simple configuration change, you can basically make the uh, notifications spit out flag codes, right? And those you can then, for example, paste into some central score server and actually get um, get the challenge then solved on the score server as well, right? The way that it's built, I mean, it, for the juice shop, it doesn't really matter where the instances are running because there's no direct communication with the score server. You have to copy and paste this, the flag uh, manually. Um, basically, there's one shared secret that you need to have across all participating instances, right? But in theory, if and if it's just uh, just for fun, CTF, um, you could have people participate with their local installations or with centrally hosted ones, as long as they share the same CTF key um, and know where the core server is, then they can basically all participate in the CTF. So I think it's, I hope it's obvious that this is more meant for for fun and not uh, for commercial CTFs where you can actually get prize money. To actually make this a bit more convenient to set up, we have a, an additional tool in the juice shop called our CTF extension. And that allows you to quickly set up um, a complete juice shop CTF on uh, CTFD, the Facebook CTF server, or uh, root the box. How is it doing this? Well, basically you install a little um, NPM module on your computer or you run it in Docker if you want. And when you start the tool, it will basically ask you a couple of questions and then generate some data, uh, some, some backup data for the chosen platform, right? So in this case for root the box, you get an XML file. Then you go to your vanilla root the box instance and import the XML file. And uh, magically you have an entire um, juice shop uh, CTF setup. And the same works also for CTFD and FBCTF, right? So it's basically, if you try, tried it out, uh, th it doesn't take more than 10 minutes to actually get a complete CTF setup. You just have to make sure that the CTF key that you're, you're using in this tool is the same that you are using on all the instances later participating in the CTF, right? Because then only then the flag codes will match. And the tool, basically gives different uh, point values for the different challenge um, um, difficulties. And you can also choose if uh, little hints should be uh, shown on the CTF uh, score server and if they should cost points or not. So it's, it's pretty, pretty neat. You can also run this in a configurative mode. So with a config file, instead of answering the questions in the command line. So it's even possible to automate this quite nicely. So here are some screenshots. Um, I mean, CTFD, uh, you basically, you can see here a few of the categories which are uh, which are in the juice shop. It's basically importing all the 100 challenges. Root the box is really nice because it has even uh, 
nice graphics that are being imported for the different categories and stuff like that. So it's 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 pretty neat. And Facebook CDF looks uh, very pretty anyway out of the box with its uh, with its uh, world map um, approach. Something that works very very well, especially with this kind of CTF mode, but also for for training situations or university lessons, um, is the Multijuicer platform. That is a third party project, uh, but it's considered part of the Juice Shop ecosystem, so to say. But it's not part of the o of the actual OWASP project, and it allows you to conveniently launch. A Kubernetes cluster with as many juice shop instances as you want for your training or a CTF participants. And it will basically put a, a, a custom load balancer in front, which is called the juice balancer. And that will make sure that uh, once you register with a team name, that you always get back to your original instance, right? And it will, I think, by default, keep your instance alive for 24 hours and uh, shut it off afterwards, right? But thanks to the, the cookie uh, feature of the juice shop itself, you can, if you later come back and register again, uh, you can basically restore your progress on a new instance uh, and continue working with that. So it's, it's pretty, pretty convenient, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm using this in, uh, in internal trainings. Uh, at my company, and we just made had a training last week, which was over nine uh, different sessions uh, in 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 one week, and we we used the multi juicer basically as the the way to provide uh, exercise um, instances for for the participants, and uh, it ran on OpenShift with I think forty instances with no no big problems. So nobody complained that anything was not available or stuff. I think a few training participants used local installations of their own, but most people just relied on our um, multi juicer deployment, which is really nice. And I mean, for CTFs, that that makes even more sense, right? Because you then just, just host everything centrally and participants, participants can just come by and uh, join the CTF very conveniently. Another feature of the Juice Shop is our rebranding. So you basically can make the Juice Shop look completely different. That was a contribution actually out of out of the need that when you when you want to demonstrate some security vulnerabilities and you do it in the original juice shop look and feel. Some people will not really feel the connection to that, right? Because it's some artificial website. They don't feel feel anything when they see that it's being hacked. But if you are able to make the uh, application where you demonstrate some security issues, if you make that look like an actual application of the company or organization where you are showing this, that's a completely different story, right? And I can just quickly show you how that how that looks in real life. So let's see. If you start the do shop by default, you get the do shop look and feel, right? If you pass in an environment variable, for example, let's use not Mozilla because we had that in the screenshot. Let's use 7MS for the seven minute security podcast. So it will start the server again. Gives me a little warning here that something might not be perfectly configured. It gives me a few warnings when it tries to download some images because when you configure your own theme, you can basically just tell the juice shop where it should download images for products and stuff. And it will then try to actually do that. So let's just show how the scoreboard looks when we refresh. So you can already see it's now a different colors, uh, color scheme. It has its own 
logo up here, right? And if we go to the main page, we actually have completely different products, right? And you can see some, well, it wasn't able to download the images properly because probably they moved or something, but you can actually see that also the product descriptions and everything is uh, has been has been updated and it it goes even further like for example if we go to the to the about us page which i didn't show in the original theme but it has the social media link uh, bar down here but this uh, this now shows the links to uh, the 7 minute security twitter and slack channel instead of owas juice shops own and yeah, basically that is all configurable completely um, in a simple, well, not simple, but in YAML form, right? So you can basically define almost anything in the Jew shop um, with your own values. So you can ju could just rename it if you want and leave everything by uh, in the default settings. You can change the logo icon, the theme, if the version number should be shown in the menu and 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 uh, all kinds of stuff, right? So it's all configurable and it's all pretty well documented how you can actually configure it and what restrictions there are. Uh, and I can even edit it in the slides. You can, as we just saw, also change all the products, right? So you can basically override every every product with your own description price with the image, which as I said, can be a link. And another nice thing actually is that the juice shop will actually uh, check if your configuration makes sense. Well, I actually created a configuration for my for my company some time ago, um, but I didn't update it with the latest changes. So we might just now see that it has one one error, right? So there's one warning, which is a yellow okay. So that's that's it, that wouldn't prevent it from starting. But here we have uh, a missing memory, which is an entry on the photo wall, basically. So in order to, uh, this challenge at the moment with my current configuration here would not be solvable, right? It's not possible to solve this challenge properly because of some missing information. Um, and you, then basically have to fix that and then you can start the the application again right so that's basically the idea and the more errors you, you get all the errors that that uh, mess up your your configuration listed upon start okay so maybe uh before we jump into the let's say things behind the scenes uh if there are any questions maybe now is a good good time for those from the functional perspective of the juice shop, basically. Sorry, I was going to just jump right in. I don't see any questions in there. There are just a couple of things about the 20th anniversary. Um, but yeah, no no questions about juice shop itself because everything's been really straightforward and you've been explained wonderfully. So, Okay, good. Thank you. Then we can dive again into into the slide deck. So let's take a look a little bit of a, a little look behind the scenes, so to say. So um, the juice shop is built on, uh, well, I wrote those slides also several years ago uh, when I started with the project, but I would co still call it relatively modern web architecture. So we are using an Angular front end um, with material design and uh, all the fancy stuff. And the backend is a Node.js server with uh, the Express framework for all the, the, basically the routes that you can visit. So basically all the APIs. We use a very lightweight SQLite database. So database meaning it's basically a file, right? So uh, you don't need to launch a database server to start the juice shop. Um, and that is one of the plus sides. I think it, you can, put the entire juice shop into a Docker image and just have to fire up that image. There's no Docker compose involved, no configuration of uh, containers talking to each other or anything. So it's everything is running in one container, which is pretty, makes it pretty easy to actually launch anywhere. 
So yeah, that's basically the setup uh, from a technical point of view. And it's it's really easy to install. So you can either run it locally, like I'm just doing it uh, on, on my computer here with Node.js directly. You can run the Docker image. If you want, you can also use Vagrant um, and you can basically run it on every cloud provider that you can think of. Um, we have instructions for the major ones, how to set it up efficiently on, on each of those, right? Heroku is actually a, a special case because they have a nice feature uh, called uh, deploy. It's a deploy to Heroku button. So when you are on the on the uh, website of the juice shop uh, on the in the readme page in the GitHub repo and you click that uh, deploy to Heroku button, it will basically directly send you over there and uh, start start an instance for you for free, which is really really convenient. So. That's something that I also use in, in training. So right, if everything else fails, so someone comes completely unprepared, has, doesn't have Node.js installed, cannot run Docker for some reason, then I always tell them, OK, please just click that deploy to Heroku button and wait a few minutes, and then you have your instance running. right? Or you have everything prepared for everybody with Multijuicer anyway. right? Then you don't need that. But for, let's say, spontaneous uh, sessions, it's pretty easy to actually just get your Heroku instance uh, going. Juice Shop is translated quite a bit into different languages. So we have roughly 100. I mean, it changes a bit, but, but way over 90% of translation uh, for, for German, obviously, because that's, I basically do that by default. Uh, also for uh, for uh, simplified Chinese and also for uh, for Spanish and um, there's lots of other languages also available. Not fully translated, but uh, some some are in a really really good good place. Um, and we offer translations for or we we make it uh, it's possible to translate strings in the for the juice shop front end so basically all the static labels and and titles and stuff but you can also translate the products for example so maybe just to to quickly prove that that works and i think i have shut down my server so let's start it again i can also do that on the demo instance i guess let's go there Oh no, someone killed it. That's one of the <laughs> that's one of the good things about having this uh, public demo instance um, on Heroku. I have written somewhere in the documentation that you're not supposed to hack it, but someone someone always gets it shut shut down with playing around. But I mean, it's okay. So let's see, it should be up again. And I can now switch, for example, to German, right? And you can see that here some of the, the static labels are immediately translated. And for, you can also see that here now the back end, uh, the, the, the things that come from the back end basically are also translated. And that uh, the little, um, Thermometer here basically uh, gives a rough indication of how much of the the system is actually translated, right? Um, how many of the strings? So maybe a little bit even even further uh, behind the scenes. Of the of the actual uh, code base and stuff, um, I'm a pretty big fan of test automation because I don't like to be this guy here at the top of the test pyramid, right? Who has to actually find all the mistakes that I myself or others made in the code uh, manually by exploration and painful uh, trial and error. So that's why we have lots of different test layers. So we have, for example, unit tests in the back end and also in the front end. Um, we have API tests, which are quite sophisticated and basically test um, 
the actual functionality of all the endpoints. And the thing that, uh, that basically I'm most proud of is our end-to-end -end test suite, which is a little bit different than you would normally write it, right? Because normally you would write your tests to actually prove that all the functionality works, right? So we would use an end-to-end -end test maybe to put some stuff into the shopping basket and check out and see that you actually get the confirmation and stuff like this. But here we actually use it uh, to, to, to test the hacking challenges. So we have a almost full coverage of end-to-end -end tests, which essentially go over the entire list of hacking challenges and do automated exploits of those. And then go to the scoreboard to actually check if the correct one was uh, turned green, basically, right? And then uh, continue with the next test. So when our tests down here uh, pass, then from a technical perspective, everything should be okay to deploy. And if this also passes, then I'm pretty sure that nobody broke any of the hacking challenges. So there's not much manual testing going on even after, uh, even before bigger bigger go lives, right? So it's, it's uh, pretty uh, rigorously automated, I would say. Speaking about automation, we also love to automate all our Sorry, I did DevOps want to cut stuff. In for just one yes. Second. Um, yeah. There is a question now, which is actually a really good one. So, are there any risks to my home network security if I decide to install to shop on my home PC network for individual learning? Okay, if you install it on your on your home computer, there's no no danger, I would say, um, because it's I mean it's just. Uh, it's just a local running server, and if you don't make it public anywhere, then nothing, nothing really bad can happen from it. There are some hacking challenges which uh, allow you, for example, to to read uh, arbitrary files from the disk or do other stuff. But there should there, there's not really something where you can can destroy uh, your hard disk or do any any crazy stuff. But there are some challenges, obviously, where uh, we store data in a database, right? So there's lots of stored XSS uh, challenges and SQL injection and and other uh, remote code execution stuff. And those we consider dangerous when you have them public on the internet. That's why we, by default, um, turn off those challenges um, when you run the juice shop in Docker or on Heroku. Because, for example, I don't want people to use actual stored XSS attacks against other people by by putting some some evil payloads into our uh, our public demo instance, right? So that's that's nothing you really want to want to have. So that's why those challenges are turned off, and by that I mean that the vulnerabilities are also turned off. So you cannot do stored XSS. Um, at least you you shouldn't be able to do stored XSS. Uh, in the public instances that we have, but for your local instance, everything is possible, and you shouldn't you shouldn't endanger yourself or your computer. Yeah. But of and course, then... this is an MIT licensed project, so I will not uh, be responsible or held accountable for any damage you still might do by doing something really crazy with the juice shop. Sure, and it looks like there's a follow-up question to that too. So, how does juice shop compare to other OWASP? products that are vulnerable applications. So the, the one listed here is Mutiliday. We can throw, you know, Shepherd or Goat or whatever. Um, how do they compare and are they related? Are there any crossover between their challenges? Um, well, I, I think uh, Juice Shop is basically the one that tries the most to be as realistic as possible, right? So actually to give the full real web application experience. Um, of course, I mean there's overlap in the in the uh, in the things that we try to get across. So if you, for example, do a web code lesson on cross-site scripting, that's of course a good starting point to then later try cross-site scripting in the juice shop. Um, there's no direct connections, but uh, yeah, I mean I, I think by by now the juice shop is probably the, I mean not not probably it's it's the biggest. The biggest collection of hacking exercises, but it's not necessarily the application you should or you 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 would always start with, especially when you are, for example, um, self-learning. So there's no no lesson being taught, and Juice Shop is introduced and stuff. It can be a bit overwhelming to start with the Juice Shop, 
um, then maybe it's it's easier for you to run through the let's say web code exercises and once you basically understood how cross site scripting works and stuff then get back to the juice shop and try that out in, in a more realistic application setup cool cool yeah those are the only questions we had okay that's it with the questions or yeah yeah i'm sorry those are the only questions we had okay very good so on the um, on the operational side, um, we also have lots of lots of nice tooling in in in, in play. And to be honest, um, sometimes when when I'm when I'm working in uh, on on or looking at software projects in an enterprise uh, enterprise scope, um, uh, it's really it's really nice what you get for free as an open source project, right? And you can really build uh, have have an, have a really great DevOps experience, just plugging together free tools, uh, which are uh, available for open source projects, and getting the same experience in an enterprisey scope is, is well, costs a lot of money, or is really tedious because you always have to do it manually even if you want to run stuff like that on premise. So we make heavy use um, by now of um, of GitHub workflows. So we basically have a workflow for um, for CI/CD, obviously, but also a different one for doing releases. So that basically, when once I do a Git tag and push that, uh, the release workflow will run and will basically prepare everything from uh, Docker images being pushed and um, uh, version. Uh, I mean, the right packages, zip files for different operating systems are being prepared and attached to the GitHub release and everything. So that in the end, I only have to click one button to make that release public on GitHub. Um, but everything else is basically happening automatically, which is really nice. Um, we also have tracking pages for um, for our code coverage and code quality and all that uh, shenanigans. And we also use Zap, for example, to, to do um, a baseline scan, I think every week um, on the weekend for, for the juice shop. Um, but of course, we have a pretty extensive um, ignore list because we don't want Zap to actually find the problems that we know exist because we want them to be there because they are challenges. But if we, for example, by accident, build in something uh, that we shouldn't have, then uh, we, there's a chance that Zap would actually find that. And we could then either fix it or build it into a different hacking challenge. So there's lots of lots of nice tools out there actually to be to be used as an open source project, especially when it's built around this whole GitHub um, workflow slash action ecosystem. It's really working great. We also have some uh, ways to integrate with the juice shop, to, so you can actually grab some data from the juice shop. Uh, Via uh, via Prometheus, so we are basically monitoring lots of different in interesting stats. You can then have your own Grafana dashboard on top of that. Um, I will show that in a minute, and we also have a relatively new uh, feature called our solution webhook. That you that is optional. So if you pass in a, um, a webhook a URL uh, to the server when it started, then this URL will be called with this kind of payload all the time when a hacking challenge is solved. And we will also do the same later for, for the coding challenges that are currently being built. Um, yeah, and the idea is that you actually can use this, for example, for some, I mean, it's mostly again for, for central uh, deployments, right? For your local machine, it doesn't really, doesn't really bring any value. But if, for example, a teacher wants to track the progress of all the students, then he could just supply um, the same so, or an individual solution webhook for every instance, and then see who actually solved which challenge. Um, it also passes on the cheat score of the challenge itself, and also the total cheat score that the the user actually um, acquired so far. So it m gives you uh, some kind of indication of this if this is actually a serious student or if, if it's just someone who's running some some python script from the internet to solve everything this is currently being um being adopted in, in multi-juicer 
with the idea of having at some point a central scoreboard across all the instances. Uh, and um, I think also the OWASP uh, security knowledge framework are using this for, because you can, from that project, you can start Jushop labs. So that's how they call it. So you can basically launch um, Jushop instances to, sol to solve one specific challenge. And the plan is to actually recognize via this webhook at some point if, if you actually solve them correctly. And as I just mentioned, we have this uh, monitoring capability with uh, with Prometheus and Grafana dashboards. And I can just show that real quick here. This is the Grafana dashboard for the juice shops demo instance that I just went to and it was down, right? And you we probably it was somewhere somewhere here in this in this time frame right when we just tried to visit it and it didn't didn't uh, respond so this basically gives you an idea of okay how how many challenges have been solved uh, what types of challenges what is the current cheat score um then other technical stuff right like what you would expect uh, cpu usage memory usage stuff like this but it also gives you some business in air quotes metrics, uh, like how many orders are placed, how much uh, how, how much money is in all the digital wallets of the users combined, how many user signups, et cetera. I mean, this is more for fun, of course, but um, the especially the challenge tracking and the technical metrics are pretty useful um, for, for especially for centralized instances. And this, this Grafana dashboard is actually um, also built into, or basically I, I copy pasted this board from a similar one that comes with Multijuicer, where you can then basically view the progress in, in, uh, of all the different, different teams. And it, I think it even shows you the log file of the server. So you can pretty nicely also do some troubleshooting for students and stuff. Just really quickly. Okay. Um, yes. How often is the project updated, and how often are new challenges added frequently? I didn't get the second part of the question. Uh, it's the same sort of concept. So, how often is the project updated, and then how how often are new challenges added? Okay. Um, new challenges are not added that much anymore. Actually, I'm thinking about more, uh, removing a few challenges because they kind of they, they didn't age so well. Um, I mean, we are at roughly 100, which is which is quite a. I mean, it will take take you some time to actually get through all of them. Um, still, releases are happening very frequently. I would say so. Um, basically, here you can see the last uh, last releases that happened. So since uh december so we had quite a few quite a few minor and patch releases and so, as you can see from the from the version number it's major version 12 so we also do a lot of incompatible updates of the of the whole system so somebody who wants to use this tool regularly should you know update their docker images and tooling etc pretty pretty regularly as well yeah that would that would help um I mean, then you get all the bug fixes, all new challenges, UI updates, and all this stuff. Um, you have to be a little bit careful when when major version version changes occur, but we do, I think, a pretty good job of uh, documenting all the changes in the GitHub releases. So let's see. So basically, it lists all the things that uh, that that happened, and it, especially for incompatible stuff, we have some some special icons that we use for example this release although it wasn't a major release but this had some changes for the challenges for one challenge in particular so that might have some impact if you use it in a training and you have some solution script that the users should follow maybe you need to change that right so it's it's always worth taking a look at at these and if we have real technical breaking uh, changes Let's see, uh, if I get back to 12.0, then we basically give a pretty good overview of, of all those, right? So here, for example, the version 12 release, 
um, had some technical breaking changes, right? Like uh, it has been upgraded to uh, Angular 10, for example. And there are also some experimental features had, that have been added um, where you cannot rely on them staying there because we might remove them if they don't work like we want. And yeah, you can see it's a pretty, pretty detailed, detailed list of, of uh, uh, release logs or release uh, Sorry. items. And then in terms of tutorial challenges and providing fixes for secure code, uh, you yeah. showed one example where you know you picked out the line and then uh, you, you described how there would be a solution for it. Is that available for all of the code snippets, uh, like the ideal fix for the solution? I mean, at the moment, we I mean we don't have code snippets for all challenges, but for those challenge challenges where we have a code snippet, we plan to also have this fixing part. Okay. Um, it, we have to see how that works out because some, I mean, for for some uh, challenges, the the actual solution might be might be pretty easy to find, and we don't want people to. Uh, we want to avoid that we show four almost identical code snippets as the solution, right? And then you have to look at a very minor detail, like oh, here's a comma, or here's an additional, or this or that. So it's actually supposed to be like really different approaches and only one makes the most sense. And we might, for some challenges, we might only have, I don't know, two options to choose from. For others, we might have four or five. It depends a little bit on the type of challenge, but we, we will try to make this whole system as flexible as possible. And even I, I was thinking about for some challenges, maybe it's it's even easier to just uh, provide some some textual explanation of what would you do to avoid this problem, right? So you don't have to look at source code and find the right fix, but basically just read through different um, scenarios of how you could address this or mitigate the risk or whatever. And then you pick the right one from, from that. And we try to build that system as flexible as we can. And then it looks like the last question is, is there an online community? So where can people go if they want to learn more about Juice Shop? Is there Slack? Is there Discord? Yeah, there's everything. <laughs> Wait, let me let me show the the website again. So if you if you go to the OWASP main page and you go into projects, I think we're at the moment at the at in the top three. So or you can just go to OWASP juice.shop, which will redirect you to this same place here. And here you can find all the all the links at the right hand side. So to the source code, documentation, to the slides I'm just showing, uh, and to the different uh, community options. So we have a, a Gitter chat, which is mostly used for um, I don't know advice, installation problems, a little bit of support. Um, there's a subreddit that is not really used that much, uh, except for distributing coupon codes. And uh, there's also, of course, a Slack channel in the OWASP Slack instance. If you want to go real retro, you can also go into the uh, join the Google group, but that is uh, basically more like a how is it called dead dead letterbox or dead mailbox. So yeah, not, not not so much going on there to be honest. So basically, you find everything on the on the homepage from from the links to. Uh, to the uh, version list, to the other projects in the ecosystem, all kinds of stuff is basically on the main on the on the website. And of course, also uh, information about how to donate to the project if you wish to do so. Okay. Any other questions? Nope, that is the last of them. OK, good. So looking at the time, um, I will skip the FAQ part. I mean, um, this basically answers a few, some really frequently asked, some we made up, um, questions about how to use the juice shop. I think most of them should be pretty pretty obvious. Um, there's maybe just, the, the for example, the one why some challenges are not available, right? That was this Heroku Docker public instance thing that I already explained. Um, two things which are um, maybe interesting. So if you are stuck 
with a oh come on oh okay that that doesn't work anymore if you are stuck with a particular hacking challenge i would totally recommend to um, take a look at our uh, online documentation which is basically you can also get this as an ebook if you want also for free but this basically has has everything from installation and inst instructions um, over customization guide right so if you want to create your own look and feel this is all extensively documented here and it also provides um, information on the different hacking challenges so for example if we take a look here there are some hints on how you can find the scoreboard and there are hints for all all the 100 challenges and um, also the contribution guidelines and all that stuff is in here right um, overview of the source code of the code base for beginners and all that stuff and even uh, complete step-by-step -step solutions for all the hacking challenges are available. So basically you can, if you if you really tried and you gave up on one of the challenges, you can go here, look up the challenge and then basically follow the described steps and then it should actually, uh, should actually work. So, and if you choose to uh, contribute, um, first merge pull request basically uh, equals free stickers. So that's uh, a tradition that I started uh, basically pretty pretty early since I have stickers for the project. And um, so when you when you get your first pull request merged, if you send me your um, your post address, then I will send you a couple of stickers and maybe a postcard and what whatever other. Uh, Merchandise that fits into an envelope that I can find, and uh, my 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 core team colleagues and also some of the contributors for, from previous summer of code sessions, etc., they uh, can um, they have received some bigger merchandise as well, right, for their contributions. So like some people have T-shirts and and uh, marks and other stuff. Also. I will not play this here because we are already a little bit over time, um, but I totally recommend listening to the Juice Shop jingle, um, which is currently at uh, 34,000, almost 34,000 uh, plays on SoundCloud, which is pretty pretty nice. I think it's the only open source project that has a jingle, at least I don't know of any other, and it's, it's really amazing. It's also actually part of one of the hacking uh, challenges, so the the bonus payload challenge basically asks you to include this little uh, player here via cross-site scripting into the juice shop. Um, it will give you the basically the success notification once you did that. So it will not check if you listen to it completely, but I totally recommend to invest those slightly less than three minutes because it's really it's a really catchy song. And of course, the lyrics are also in the documentation in, in our um, here in our documentation website slash ebook. Okay, so to wrap things up, um, this is my my personal favorite uh, slide because uh, it just shows some some really really fancy numbers. Um, so the juice shop over time had a total of eighty contributors by now. It's an OWASP flagship project. Um, we have a gold medal from the Core Infrastructure Initiative Best Practices, uh, which is now with the Open C uh, Source Security Foundation. Uh, I hope we can keep that uh, still. So I know that there were some arguments within that uh, consortium basically to decide if Shop should get a gold medal because it's vulnerable. But uh, let's say the technical and process things are actually quite sophisticated, I would say, that we do. And if you don't count the intended vulnerabilities, then it's it's pretty it's pretty neat. Uh, test coverage for an open source project of almost 90%. I find that quite, quite nice always. Um, as I said, I'm trusting our test suite enough to just do deployments without mostly any manual testing. Um, and uh, pre-release at least. And also quite impressive, uh, we have 21 million Docker image pulls by now in total, 
which is slightly more than the 28,000 SourceForge downloads. But we also still push to SourceForge because I was told that some companies don't allow access to GitHub, but for some completely unknown reasons still allow SourceForge access. So we basically mirror our releases over to SourceForge as well. On the roadmap, evolving the code snippets into these coding challenges, like I showed, this is um, uh, one of our Google Scrum of Code projects this year. Um, I would actually like to refine and get some live feedback on, on the cheat detection and solution webhook uh, topics. Um, that would be nice. So if you are playing around with that and have some feedback, please just uh, hit me up on Slack or Gitter or pay via email. Totally fine. I'm, I'm very happy for any kind of feedback there. And um, we actually now have our own GitHub org. So github.com slash juice shop. And all the projects are already there except for the main repository because that has the most dependencies on surrounding services. And I didn't want to do that transition while Google Summer of Code is running. And um, I might actually break more stuff than I'm able to fix in my limited time. So that's that's why it's um, the main juice shop repo is still at my personal GitHub account, but everything else is already in the org. But I hope end of the year latest, um, everything juice shop related will be in this GitHub org. But as always, timeline is uh, when it's done because it's an open source project and relies on free time being available and contributors and yada, yada, yada. So here's some additional links. This is basically the only one that you really need because you find basically everything there on the website. And that's basically it. Sorry for being a little bit over time. No, 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 you're perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you again for coming in and for speaking to us about Juice Shop. I mean, this is one of the tools that I've used to hone my skills as an application security tester. Um, yeah, and uh, just for general announcements, so the next meetup is scheduled for Thursday, August 19th. It's going to be a Capture the Flag event. Um, unfortunately, we are not using uh, uh, Juice Shop to, to demo this. Um, Maybe but next we are time. having somebody else coming in um, to, to provide a CTF environment. So be aware of that, and we'll post the information accordingly. And one last reminder, again, a free virtual online event for OWASP's 20th anniversary. That is September 24th. Um, I don't know exactly how long it'll last today or what the time frame is, but I've heard 24 hours possibly. Yeah, it's 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 so. supposed to be 20, 24 hours around the globe. So basically, uh, OWASP will host sessions from all the time zones. So basically, there should be there should should be something for everyone, and maybe even some talks where it's worth to stay up a little bit longer or get up very early. So certainly, certainly, yeah. So thanks again, uh, Bjorn, for coming in, and yeah, do you're you welcome. Any final comments or anything else to add? Yeah, I'm, I'm always very, very happy to get feedback, no matter how you use the juice shop, if you do it for your personal education or if you use it in a training or a lecture setup, or even if you, for example, are a security tool vendor and use juice shop as a guinea pig, um, I, I love to have to, to get any, any feedback. And uh, yeah, so if, if we can improve any of the official use cases of the juice shop, we are always happy to do so. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming in. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.